Okay, so let's go ahead and switch over to the document camera. And this corresponds to section R4 in the textbook or the ebook, which you can is available in MyLabs Plus. But we're going to be talking about factoring polynomials. Okay, but first, uh, let's think about uh, what the word factor means. Okay, so given a math problem, uh, a multiplication problem, for instance, um, usually a mathematician or a math teacher will tell you, find the product of these two numbers, okay? Uh, they'll say, find the product. Of course, in your head, you're translating this to multiply, right? So the product is what we call the result of that multiplication. In most of y'all's heads, you're probably thinking, okay, well, that's just the answer to my problem. <laughs> but we're going to use this word product a lot. Um, so if we needed to find the product, for example, of find the product of four times six. Well, we know that that should be what, 24? But I wanna break down the anatomy of this statement here because we've done a process of multiplication and we know that the result is what we're gonna be referring to as the product. But what we call the two things that we multiply together to get that product, these are gonna be called the factors. So factor is just a word that means, if we use it as a noun, the factors are just the two numbers or objects that you use to multiply to make a bigger product, okay? So um, this is very similar to the distributive property. Uh, similar. To the distributive property because this distributive property is a form of multiplication, right? So let's think of this in a completely numerical sense. Imagine that I had two times, uh, let's say, one plus seven. Okay. Usually, when we use the distributive property, we have some sort of variable in here, but I want to keep it very simple and just say, okay. Um, let's just use numbers so we can see how this process works. Well, I know that this is, uh, if we go ahead and use the distributive property, we can multiply this out here and here. And we should get two plus 14, which is 16. Okay, that might seem uh, painfully simple or obvious. And there are other ways to solve this, of course. We could have added one plus seven and gotten eight here and then multiplied it by two. But what, what I want to see, what I want to, I, I guess what I want to point out here is that this number, our product at the end here, we could rewrite it in terms of this multiplication that we started at the beginning. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, let me just write it out explicitly. I could say that 16 can be broken down into two times one plus seven. Okay, you might be wondering why would you do this? And uh, the 
quick answer is that you wouldn't typically do this in a completely numerical problem because there are simpler ways to simplify the expression. But for factoring polynomials, we'll see something very similar where we have sort of a larger product and we're trying to reverse the multiplication process to where we're breaking down the product into two factors that multiply to make that product. Okay. So even though I sort of boxed in this thing in with the parentheses and it has two terms in here, so we, we should probably distinguish that vocabulary just so that we're not making the mistake of sort of using the wrong words at the wrong times. Last time I said that in a polynomial terms are a numbers or variables. That in a polynomial expression are being added or subtracted. Factors are numbers or variables that are being multiplied. So they have a very specific and distinct definition. So you want to be careful not to use these words in the wrong places when you're trying to describe a problem to me, to your, your uh, classmates or to, to anybody who you're, you know, you're trying to get help with uh, your math, right? Like if you go into math world, uh, if you're using the wrong terms, they'll probably be able to figure out what you're trying to say. But if you don't get the terms right in your head, you're going to make more problems for you in terms of like understanding what, what we're really talking about, like the, the important takeaways from the process. Okay. So the, the vocabulary is going to be super important here. Uh, and we'll try to practice that as we go through problems. Um, but I want to continue this discussion of factors. Okay. So let's see. Give me just one second. Okay. So last time I said that uh, polynomials can be multiplied to produce more complicated polynomials. In the same way we can multiply numbers to create larger numbers, okay? So what I want you guys to do is take a moment to find the product of these two polynomials since we were multiplying polynomials last time. Uh, I want you to multiply x plus one times x plus two and then tell me what the result should be. So I'll give you guys about a minute to do this. Does anybody have the answer for this yet? Or the result, the product? 
Um, I have x, mm -hmm. the second power, plus yeah. 3x, plus 2. Uh, what was the middle term? Um, you said x to the second power, plus yeah. what? Plus 3x. 3x, yeah. Plus 2. Yeah, exactly. OK, so what we should get here is that this uh, polynomial, right? You can think of this like, again, factors are things being multiplied. This thing, this polynomial is a factor. And this polynomial are factors. And when you multiply them out, and you probably, you know, multiplied them using the handshake method, because that's what we did last time, uh, you would get x squared plus 3x plus 2. And this resulting trinomial is the product of these two factors. Does that make sense? Was everybody able to get this product? Or let me ask this way, right? I think this is a better way to ask. I just always uh, ask it the wrong way. Uh, does anybody have any questions or is anybody confused on onto why this is the product product of these two factors? Okay, cool. All right, well, let's look at that again. And instead of using the handshake method, let's uh, let me show you how you would do this using the distributed property. Okay, so we have x plus one times x plus two. And the distributive property looks something like this. And I think it's super helpful to have colors in the mix when you do this. The distributive property says that if you have something on the outside of parentheses, uh, let's call this b plus c. And maybe I'll put this in, just divide that up. Okay, that you would multiply this by each of these terms, right? So I would have B times A plus C times A. So we sort of want to think about it just briefly as can we use this property, this distributive property to multiply these things out instead of using the handshake method? Okay. Uh, and the answer to that question is yeah. Yeah, of course. I wouldn't ask you that um, if it were impossible. Well, we'll just take this thing, right? And we'll treat it as one large factor. This is taking the role of the A, okay? So if A is gonna be multiplied here by both of these terms in the parentheses, well, I want you to get flexible of thinking of this as this whole thing that has parentheses and has some terms inside, we're gonna treat it as one large factor. And that factor is gonna be multiplied by each of the terms in the parentheses, okay? Just like this factor, is multiplied by each of the terms in the parentheses. So what I'm gonna do is draw these arrows here to indicate that's what I'm multiplying. And then just like this line uh, says, we write the term times the factor. So that means I'm gonna take this term here, which is the X, and I'm just gonna write that down. And then I'll write the factor next to it. So in this case, the factor is X plus one. Okay, plus the term here, which is two, again, times the factor. So the factor that we're using here is in parentheses, x plus one. Now this intermediate step looks more complicated than what you would have gotten from the handshake method. But if we continue to simplify little by little, you'll see you'll get to the same place. But it's sort of important to see this uh, kind of an expression because you'll see something similar to this later on. 
and we're going to sort of reverse this process. But in any case, now if I just look at these two term, uh, these two factors here, right? The parentheses indicates I should multiply this x times everything in the parentheses. So like I'm using the distributive property a, a second time. So now I'm going to take this x and multiply it here and here. And I get x squared plus x. I'm going to do the same thing with the second set of factors. I'm going to take this positive 2 and multiply it here and here. And so I should get two more terms. I should get a positive 2x and a positive 2. Well, now I have these four terms with no parentheses. And if I can combine like terms, I'll want to go ahead and simplify this expression. Uh, well, these two terms are the x terms. They have x to the 1 power. So I can combine those and get 3x. And I'll just bring all the rest of the terms down. x squared, positive 3x. And I'll bring this one down, plus 2. and isn't this the same thing that we got when we did the handshake method? OK. Well, when you're multiplying two polynomials, the easiest way to do it, well, it's always helpful if you only have like one method to do something. Um, but in math, there's often multiple ways to do something, there's multiple ways to multiply these these two product these two factors together to get the same product. But the reason why I show you this distributive property is because the distributive property is multiplying these two polynomials together, and eventually we get this product. But factoring, in a lot of cases, it'll be helpful to think of factoring as the process of reversing the distributive property. To obtain um, simpler factors. So we're going to be learning how to dis reverse the distributive property. OK, but there are three primary methods of factorization that we're going to learn for polynomials. And so we're going to try to build up from simple building blocks to the more complicated methods. All right. Um, so let's start off with the first method. OK, so factoring methods. That's going to be the whole focus of today's lecture. Factoring out the, I'm going to say this a lot, factoring out the GCF where the GCF stands for greatest common factor. OK, well, what does that mean? The greatest common factor is the largest uh, factor. that all of the terms in a polynomial have in common.
Okay. So what I mean, what do I mean by that? Let's look at a, a, some examples here. If I want to factor nine y to the fifth power plus y to the second power. The steps that I want to take here are going to be to identify the GCF. both 9y to the fifth power and y to the second power since these are my two terms. OK. So can anybody tell me what factors of 9 are? Like, what are two numbers that multiply to make 9? Three and three. Yeah. So what I could say here is for this first term, I could rewrite this as three times three. And then what are the factors of y to the fifth power? What multiplies to make y to the fifth power? Now that might seem like a confusing question because I don't know what the value of y is. But we learned, you know, the definition of exponents, y to the fifth power literally means by definition, y times y times y times y times y. So there are five factors of y that make up this term. So what I could do over here is write y times y times y times y times y. And then what are the factors of y to the second power? If I wanted to break down that term, what multiplies to make y to the second power? y times y. y times y. OK. So this is like a, a sort of a painful process or a labor intensive process for like actually breaking these terms down into their factors and then comparing them so that we can see what do they have in common? Okay, so if you look at this fact, this set of factors and this set of factors, what do they have in common? Y's. They have Y's in common, but how many Y's specifically? Two. Yes, two Y's. This guy has two Y's and that's all that it has. And then this one has five, but what it has in common with the other term are the two y's here. And it doesn't matter which two y's you grab, right? I'm just grabbing two of them arbitrarily. So what I can say is that they both have a y squared in common. So if I wanted to write this as something, I wanted to take this original thing, this original expression, and write it as a product of two things. So I want something times something else. So these are little blanks. I know that because they have a y squared in common, that what you'll do is write the GCF out here, and the GCF is y squared. That is the largest factor that they have in common. OK, but now I need to figure out what the remaining factor is. OK, well, originally I had two terms here. So what I recommend is that you'll write some parentheses here. And you need to think about this problem. Like, we need to find two terms here that are being added together. You're not going to actually do the addition. But what I'm trying to do is set this up because this is a complicated polynomial in some sense. And we want to get the two factors that multiply to make this polynomial. So here, we can sort of think about the distributive property as 
what do I need to multiply this guy by here and here so that I get the original two terms? Okay. So once you identify the GCF of both of the terms, you're going to write that out front. And then however many terms are here originally, you'll write parentheses. And then you'll think about it as having two blanks because we have two terms that we're trying to get back to. So the second step or the final step is to reverse the distributed property. And this, this takes a little bit of creativity. Okay, so can anybody tell me if we're just focusing on this first term, y squared times what will give me back this original first term? Nine y three. Yeah, that's exactly right. And if you went over here and said to yourself, well, like, okay, we took these, this y squared out of this factor or of this term, then what's remaining are the factors of three and the factors of y. So we'll just put it back together into a nice neat package and call this nine y to the third. 9y to the third. OK, and then if we were following the distributive property, right, and multiplying it now by the second term, y squared times what gives you y squared back? One. One. Okay, yeah, and so you could check yourself and say, okay, y squared times, if I think that this is the correct second factor, nine y to the third power plus one, then you should be able to distribute that out and get the original um, the original polynomial, which in this case would be 9y to the fifth plus y squared. That works out. Okay. So the factorization of 9y to the fifth power plus y squared is y squared times 9y to the third plus one. Sorry, I ran out of space there. <laughs> Okay. Those are the two factors of this polynomial. We're going to do some more examples. I know that that was sort of uh, a lot, but hopefully as we repeat this process, you'll see uh, that it's easier to accomplish than you might think. Uh, do you guys still need to see this, write this down? For a second. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about this? I don't get it, but I'll keep trying. Yeah, I mean, uh, do you, what is it that you don't get about it? Or what is it that you think that you're supposed to be getting that you're not getting? I don't know where she, where did she get that one from? Oh, well, uh, remember we're trying to reverse the distributive property. Uh, and we're thinking about this thing times a number needs to give us back the original term. Well, y squared times one okay. is the only number that's gonna give us the original term back. Okay. Right, like if you, if you miss, uh, if you guessed wrong here and you put a y, one y, then y squared times y would have been y to the third power, but that wouldn't have given you the original problem. Or if you had guessed wrong and said, okay, I took these two, so there's nothing left. Let me put a zero here. Well, y squared times zero would be zero, and that would be wrong too. Okay. So one is the only choice that actually would return the original problem. But we'll have more examples here in a second. So I, I think it'll, it'll be a lot. I, I always feel like when I break it down into like its bare bones, it seems more complicated than it is. And it's, it's important to appreciate this 
but when you're actually doing it, uh, you're going to have a lot less appreciation for it and you're just going to do it and you'll figure out, you know, like there's a rhythm to it. Um, so let's take a look at another example. Uh, yeah. Example two. Factor the following. Um, 6x squared plus 8x minus 12. And remember, this method that we're, we're using right now is just factor out the greatest common factor, the GCF. That's all we're doing. Don't try to do anything more complicated. If you remember some other factoring methods, don't try to pull that in here. We're just factoring out the greatest common factor. Okay. So the steps are one, to identify the GCF for all of the terms, right? So if I look at 6x to the second power and 8x and 12, what you might say is like, what factors do they have in common? Uh, well, if I just focus on the numbers, the numerical part or the coefficients, what number, um, what factor does six, eight, and 12 have in common? Two. Yeah, they have a two in common, right? You don't have to go through this whole process of saying, okay, well, I know that this is two times three and that this is two times two times two, and this is two times two times three. You don't have to go through that process. You, a lot of times you can just say, okay, these are all even, so they have a factor of two in common. Okay. The tricky thing is that uh, we need to think about variables as being part of the common factor sometimes, right? So again, the GCF, you need to compare the set of three terms that we have here. So really we have an X and an X here. We have an X here, because this is eight X, and then there's no X's here. In order for, for us to identify the GCF, all three of the terms have to have that common factor. So for now, the common factor, the greatest common factor is just two. Does that make sense? Okay. So the second step is to reverse the distributive property. Reverse distribute. And so what I would say is write the GCF, which is just two. And then we need to multiply that by something that has three terms. So I would say open some parentheses and we need to give ourselves space for three terms in here. And I like to sort of, you know, while you're getting used to this, we should count the number of terms that we have. So the original problem had one, two, three terms. So we should be able to multiply this two by three terms inside the parentheses as though we're trying to set up the distributed property. We should have a plus here and we should have a minus here. And so now there's two ways you could think about this, right? I like to think about it as focusing on the first term, right? Two times what is gonna give you six X to the second power? Three X squared. Yeah, and that's exactly what we have here, 3x squared remaining, right? So if we took out the two, we have 3x squared left. That needs to go here. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And then you'll take your time. You'll go to the next term. 
Now you're asking yourself, we're going to run the distributed property forward. Two times something gives you 8x. Well, two, time, two times what gives you 8? Four. Four. And then an so x. I, so I need a four here, and then I also have an x remaining. So you can think about it like these remaining factors make up 4x. So that should go here. OK, and then the final term, uh, we're looking at 2 times something gives us 12. Well, what is that thing? Well, it's 2 times 3, which is 6. And that's it. So what we're basically saying is that we had this original complicated polynomial, this trinomial. And it could be factored into 2 times 3x squared plus 4x minus 6, where this is a factor and this is a factor. Does anybody have any questions about this one? Or comments or concerns? Okay, if it doesn't feel good right now, <laughs> whenever we, you know, jump, dive into something new, you know, it's, it's gonna feel strange it's going to feel unnatural but i assure you that knowing how to factor like so is going to help us solve more complicated problems downstream okay so it will be important to get this stuff down let's look at one more factor and i'm going to give you guys some practice example three and again remember we're just factoring out the gcf don't go any further than that. Factor out the GCF, right? So if you vaguely remember something from past math classes, don't go any further. Um, let's see. 14m plus 1 to the third power minus 28m plus 1 to the second power. Okay. Okay, so this, this looks a little bit more intimidating, for sure. Uh, can anybody tell me what they think the first step is going to be? Finding the GCF? Yeah, exactly. That is going to be the first step. Um, so can anybody tell me how many terms are in this problem in general? Count the number of terms. How many are there? Two? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, so that's exactly how I want you to see this kind of problem. Yes, it's intimidating. Yes, there's a lot of parentheses and some exponents, but I want you to, to in your mind, visually block this off as this thing and this thing are the terms. And the terms are going to be separated by addition or subtraction. Yes, there are some terms inside the, the, the parentheses, but we're going to treat that as a whole package of something inside the parentheses. Treat that as its own factor. Right, so this is a factor and this is a factor that's repeated three times in the first term. This is a factor 
And this is a factor that's repeated two times in the second term. Okay, so let's, let's identify the GCF. If I look at the two terms, this term, this big old term that has multiple factors in it, and this big old term that has multiple factors in it, what do these two terms have in common? Two. Yeah, they have a two in common for sure. Because if we're just looking at the numbers, 14 and 28, they have a two in common. Is there a larger factor that they have in common, right? Because we're trying to find the greatest common factor. Seven. 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 Uh, did somebody say something else? 14. 14 is the largest factor that goes into both of them, right? So sometimes that greatest common factor will be like screaming at your face and you'll want to go with a slightly smaller number, even though the GCF here is going to contain 14. What other factor do these two terms have in common? Not focusing on the numerical part, focusing on this big old polynomial part. Well, let me break this down differently, right? So we said that the numerical greatest common factor for sure is 14 because this could be like 14, uh, let's call it 14 times one. And let's call this 14 times two. But I said that this polynomial part, there are three copies of that polynomial. So that polynomial is a factor m plus one that happens or is copied three times here. And this one has that same factor m plus one, m plus one, two times because there are two copies. Well, do they have a polynomial factor in common? M plus one? Yeah. <laughs> and so each of them has at least two copies. So really the, the entire GCF is not just the 14, but the 14 M plus one to the second power. Right, and let me go ahead and box this stuff in, right? 14 m to the second power is a factor that occurs in both of those terms. So for a second, let's say that, okay, in the previous problems, I said we needed to find two objects that multiply by each other, that give us the original expression, that the first object is going to be the greatest common factor which we've identified to be, and I'm gonna write this sort of small, 14 m plus one to the second power. So it's like we're pulling that out or dividing it out. So the remaining factor or the remaining uh, factor over here uh, we wanna throw that in a set of parentheses we had two terms originally so there's two blanks here that i'm trying to find and let's just bring this minus sign down and rather than thinking about 14 times m plus 1 to the second power times something gives you this Let's just think about what's left over. And the only thing that's left over here is one times m plus one, right? So let's just write this as m plus one. Any questions there? 
right? And this sort of makes sense because if we were to multiply this guy by another factor of m plus one, well, you would have m plus one to the second power times itself, which would give you back m plus one to the third power. And then this guy, you know, not worrying about the specifics, what's going on in here, times something needs to give us back a 28 m plus one to the second power. Well, we already have the m plus one to the second power. So 14 times something needs to give us this 28 and it's whatever's remaining here, the two. So all we have here that's left over is the two. So that's all we need. Again, 14 m plus one to the second power times two gives you 28 m plus one to the second power. But rather than leaving this expression here with parentheses inside parentheses, uh, we might want to ask ourselves, can we just do polynomial subtraction here to simplify it? Uh, and when we're subtracting, we distribute the negative sign here. Uh, we can drop the parentheses. So if we wanted to simplify this, this other factor, Well, I could just look inside the parentheses and say m plus one minus two, if we just combine like terms and think of it like m plus one minus two, well, that simplifies down to m minus one. So it would be a lot simpler to just call this thing in parentheses. m minus 1. And so we'll just bring down the 14, bring down the GCF over here. 14 m plus 1 to the second power times this guy. And this is the factorization that we want. Okay, I know that that seemed like a lot. I'm gonna give you some practice problems here so that you guys can work together in breakout rooms. Uh, let's practice this. Factoring out the GCF. So one, six A to the second power minus 18 A to the fourth power. x to the third power, y to the second power, minus 28x second power, y to the third power, plus 21x to the second power, y to the second power, 3, 24x minus 2 to the third power, minus 16 x minus 2 to the second power. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and make these breakout rooms. Uh, once you get the invitation, go ahead and jump into those breakout rooms. OK, I think that's everybody. Um, yeah, I, I think that you know we spent about 10, 10 to 12 minutes on that. Um, if you're still working on maybe the last two problems uh, and it was taking you a while, um, it's just going to take practice to sort of get faster at this. Uh, the first problem, it, I'll show you my approach to, to going faster at these, but you'll definitely want to take your time and, uh, you know, crawl before you walk, walk before you run sort of thing. Um, for this first problem, the way I look at it is 
we could go through the, you know, the painstaking process of identifying the GCF, but once you get confident at it, what you're going to do is basically scan the two terms and say, what is the numerical part? What do they have in common? And I would say that six is the greatest common factor there because six goes into six and six goes into 18. So six goes there. And then they also have, you know, a, a variable factor in common. There are two A's here and there are four A's here. So the most A's that you'll be able to take out is really the one with the smaller variable. Uh, I'm sorry, the smaller exponent. So A squared should be uh, that common factor. So this whole thing is the GCF. Okay, then I open up some parentheses and I should have two terms in here. Okay, the boxes are just a visual trick to sort of guide you so that you don't forget that you need two terms in here. But if I took 6a squared out of the first term, what I really need to be able to do is to check myself, to make sure I'm, I'm right, multiply this in, at least in your head, and say 6a squared times what gives you the first term. Well, 6a squared is the first term. So the only thing I can multiply here to give me that original term is one. Does that make sense? Similarly, 6a squared times something needs to give me an 18. Okay, well, six times three is gonna give me 18. And then a squared times something needs to give me the a to the fourth power. So that's why I need another a to the second power here because remember you add those exponents. So this will be the, the second factor. So this is gonna be the factorization. 6a is one of the factors. And then this big old thing in parentheses is a polynomial factor. Is that what you guys got? Or you maybe if you yes. didn't get it. If you didn't get it, I got that, sir. Cool. Yes. If you didn't get it, hopefully you're on, on track to getting it and maybe just made a little uh, original. <laughs> Okay, so the same thing is going to happen here, but like I said, instead of going through the, you know, the linear process of finding the, the GCF and then basically crossing out the common factors and then seeing what you have left over, I scan the problem and say, okay, let's look at the numerical part first. So 14, 28, and 21. What factor, what numerical factor do they have in common? Seven. Seven. Seven is the greatest factor that goes into them, at least numerically. Then I'll say, okay, uh, the x's. I'll look at each of the terms and say, how many x's can I take out of each of them? Or what? how many do they have in common? x squared. x squared. So I'm slowly building up my GCF. My GCF. Okay, so I have to look at the y's now. And the most y's I can take out is y squared, y squared. This is y to the third, but there's a y squared in there. So that'll be my GCF. I'll open up parentheses, and I'm gonna make a big set of parentheses because I need one, two, three terms to figure out. Uh, and sometimes if you write really big, you might just want to open the parentheses and then hold off on closing them until you get the three terms. Okay, so seven x squared y squared, I need to multiply that by something so that I get the original first term back. Well, I have seven times something needs to give me a 14. That tells me I need a two. x squared times something needs to give me x to the third power. So I need another x in here. y squared times something gives me a y squared. Well, that would be a one, but whenever you multiply a one here, it's not gonna make a difference. So we'll just leave it as two x. 
And I know that it's a alphabet soup here of numbers and letters, but if you slowly go through this multiplication, this thing times two X gives you the original thing. Then we can move on to the next term. The next term is negative, so I need a negative sign here. So seven times a number gives me 28. Well, that's gonna be four. X times a number gives me X squared. I'm sorry, X squared times something gives me X squared. Well, since I already have X squared, I, I don't have to multiply anything new in here because if I throw an extra X, I'll get X to the third power and that would be wrong. So I can just move on to y squared times something gives me y to the third power. That says that we need an extra y in here. Does that make sense? Okay, again, alphabet soup of numbers and letters, but if you multiply this factor by this term, you get the original term back. Finally, seven times three so we need a plus here because this is a positive. Three gives you the 21. And then we already have the x squared and the y squared. So we don't need anything extra. So 2x minus 4y plus 3, we can leave it alone because those are not uh, like terms. So that has to be the, the remaining factor. So this expression here is going to be the factorization of the original problem. And then similarly with this guy, I have a numerical factor, I have a polynomial factor, okay? So I'll start with the numerical factors first and say, what is their greatest common factor for this 24 and the 16? Well, that has to be uh, eight. Now, if you guess wrong and you said uh, four or two, um, that's that's not incorrect. It's just remember, you need to be finding the greatest common factor, the largest number that goes into both of these. And then of the polynomial factors, it looks like we have x minus 2 in common, but they have two copies here and three copies here, so I can pull two of those out. So this thing is the GCF. And then we need to multiply that by something. Probably shouldn't have closed it up. But in any case, that has two factors in here. And since we were originally subtracting them, I should bring that down. OK, well, if you think about it this way, we have 24x minus 2 to the third power. We took 8 out. So it's like we divided eight out. 24 divided by eight is three. And we took two of these guys out. So we should have one of them remaining, x minus two. Then we divided out from 16 an eight. So we should have a two here. 16 divided by eight gives you the two. Or alternatively, eight times the two gives you the 16, right? Because multiplication and division are two sides of the same coin. You can look at it either way. Uh, and then we divided out this x minus two to the second power. So if we multiplied another one in, we would get the wrong exponent. So we're just gonna leave it at a two. Okay, so if you ever have a weird complicated expression in this set of parentheses, well, then we need to simplify it some, uh, a little bit further. And so ignoring everything else for now, what we might want to do is call this 3x minus 6 minus 2. That simplifies further to 3x minus 8. 
So this factor needs to be rewritten as 3x minus 8. And then we can't forget to bring our GCF down. 8 times x minus 2 to the second power. So 8 times x minus 2 to the second power times 3x minus 8 would give you the original expression back. I know that these kinds of problems are a lot. I think there is one or two of them in the homework that I'm gonna open up for you guys. Um, but if you have trouble with these harder ones, you definitely need to get into math world. And like I said, spring break is next week. So make sure that you're doing that uh, either today, tomorrow or Friday or Saturday, right? Because uh, math world won't be available over the break. Um, and so we'll, we'll be using this principle of uh, factoring out the GCF in the next method of factorization, which is what we're getting into right now. Okay. Uh, let's see. Method two. Factoring by grouping. Okay, a note on factoring out the GCF. This can be done, factoring out the GCF can be done on any polynomial, uh, regardless of the number of terms. So if you have a two term polynomial, you can look at the two terms and find out what their GCF is and then factor that out. If you have a three term polynomial, you can look at all three terms and then factor out their GCF, four terms, five terms, et cetera, okay? Factoring by grouping is typically done on four term polynomials. So we'll see in this next set of problems that each of the problems will have four terms. And we're not really gonna deviate from that as far as this method is concerned in your homework and on the test, whenever you're asked to factor by grouping, there will only be four terms in the polynomial. Similarly, if you're given a polynomial and it just says factor and you count the number of terms and there are four, then that signals to you that at some point you will factor by grouping. Okay, so let's talk about factoring by grouping by jumping into our first example. Now, I'm, I'm sure that you guys are, are waiting with bated breath uh, thinking that this is going to be much more complicated than factoring out the GCF. Um, so let me go ahead and write this down. And then we'll see that it's actually not much more complicated than factoring out the GCF. So I have mp to the second power plus 7m plus 3p to the second power plus 21, a four-term polynomial. And what you want to do here is you might, you know, uh, you walk up to this polynomial, you maybe find it in the streets. Uh, it, it's just like hanging out and you're like, hey, polynomial, what are you up to? You know, you look it up and down. Um, and then you might say to yourself, okay, well, I, I just learned how to factor out the greatest common factor. So if I look at all of these terms, do all of the terms have some common factor? And then you might say, well, these two have an M in them. These two have P squared. These have 
a factor of seven in them. And these have a factor of three. But not all of them have an M. Not all of them have a P. Not all of them have a seven. And not all of them have a three. So we can't factor out the greatest common factor from all of the terms. But what we can do is basically break this up into two smaller polynomials that are being added to each other and think about it like, okay, let's ignore the second set of terms, right? These two over here, let's ignore them for a second. Do these guys have a common factor? Can we factor out the greatest common factor? Well, they both have an M in common. So what happens if we factor out the M? Again, I'm gonna lift my hand here, but ignore this side, all right? So on the left side of this little dashed line, uh, just looking at these two terms, I can factor out an M. And then that would leave me with a P squared plus seven. Are you guys okay with that factorization? Is there anything complicated there? Any questions, confusions, concerns? Just factoring out the GCF. And in fact, if I did multiply this back in, I could check myself. M times P squared is MP squared. M times seven is seven M. Okay. So once I've done that, I'm gonna ignore the left side and look at these two terms and ask myself, do they have a common factor? The factor could be a numeric, it could be a variable, or it could be a combination, okay? Uh, and I would say like, yeah, yeah, they have a three in common. So let's just factor out the three. Let's do what we can, three, okay? Well, what I'd be left with is p squared and then three times something gives me the 21 and that has to be a seven. And now does this make sense to you guys? Right, nothing strange there. And this is a positive three. So I'm gonna bring down this positive sign. And now I'm looking at this line here because I've processed the left side of this polynomial, I've processed the right side of the polynomial. If I ignore the original stuff and I was just given this problem, I have one term over here, that's m times this polynomial, and one term over here that's three times this polynomial. Does this term and this term, when we compare them as separate terms, do they have a common factor? Well, yeah, this polynomial factor, p plus seven, p, p squared plus seven, is the greatest common factor of this line. So let me factor that out because that's the greatest common factor now. P squared plus seven, that's the GCF. And then what's left over is M plus three. And that's the other factor. So this thing, this expression of this polynomial times this polynomial is the factored form of our original expression. Does anybody have any questions about that? In essence, what we've done is uh, 
we split this problem into two halves and then we just factor out the GCF, factor out the GCF, and then a third time factor out the GCF. What if they didn't fall like that? Uh, what you mean that, what if these didn't like, have? Yeah, like your original problem, what you had like the MP on the other side and the 21 by the seven, you would just divide, still divide it in half and factor what you could on each side? Yeah, and there are some problems in the homework where um, you might have to rearrange the terms. And that's perfectly okay because when you're adding and subtracting, it really doesn't matter what order you do that. So sometimes you'll have to rearrange or swap some terms around so that you get this situation where now the first two terms do have something in common and the second two terms will have something in common. And then you can proceed with this process. So let's let's see if we, we run into something like that. Um, I'm not sure that I've gotten an example like that, but let's do some more examples. Example two, um, two y squared plus a z minus two z minus a y squared. And remember, we are factoring by grouping. And the thing that tells us that we need to factor by grouping is that there are four terms in the polynomial. Okay. Does anybody know how to start this one? We rearrange it? Yeah. Yeah, because if we look at the first two terms, uh, 2y squared and az don't have any common factors. So we're going to have to swap some things around. What I recommend doing is I always just take, and don't ask me why, it's, it's just like it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but for some reason, I always take the second and the last term and flip them, flip their positions. And that tends to, to basically right the ship so that we can actually factor this. So you might need to reorder the polynomial in order for this to work. So we'll have 2y squared. And then if we put minus a y squared here, minus 2z, and then we'll have plus a z there. And then we could think about what happens when we sort of draw this uh, imaginary dash line here just to visually separate the two halves. Then we can ask ourselves for this first smaller polynomial, what is their common factor, their greatest common factor? Y squared? Yeah. So I'll write y squared out here. And I'll open up some parentheses since there's nothing else that they have in common. Um, then I need a, a, what needs to go inside the parentheses? 2y squared minus a? Uh, not 2y squared, because if I had 2y squared here, I'd have y squared times y squared, which is why. Yeah, just two. Just two. two. Oh, no a? No, 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 you do need an a, but for the first term. Okay. For the first term, you just need a two. For the second term, you need minus a. Right. So again, if you were to distribute this out, you would get the two original terms, 2y squared, and then you get uh, a y squared. Does that make sense? And then we can go over here to the second side. And here we have to be careful because this first term has a negative sign. So Whenever this first term has a negative sign, you're going to want to factor out a negative common factor. So we're going to bring the negative sign down and then ask ourselves, what do these two terms have in common? The Z? Yeah, the Z. 
but you have to be mindful of the of the Z. Let me make these purple. Um, because since this was a negative, and since we have a negative Z here, we're really going to be multiplying in a negative Z to these two terms. Okay, so for the first term that's missing, negative z times what gives me negative 2z? Two. 2. Yeah, but just a positive 2. Because this negative sign out here takes care of negative times a positive gives me a negative. So if you're struggling with negatives and positives, this is going to be hard. <laughs> Um, so you just have to get down that negative times a positive gives you a negative. Because this next term that we're missing, we need negative z times something to give us a positive. So just thinking about the sign, negative times a what is going to give us a positive? Minus. Minus. So I need, a, I need a negative thing here. And negative z times a negative blank gives me a z. Negative well, a? Yeah, I just need that negative a here. Okay, now that might seem complicated because you do have to take care with the sign here when you bring down this negative sign and then multiply it in that the negative times the negative needs to give you back the positive. But what you're also looking for that tells you you're on the right track is that the thing in parentheses here and the thing in parentheses here need to match exactly. So if you had a minus sign but a plus sign here, and the signs don't match, then you've made a mistake. But since they match exactly, then we can say 2 minus a is going to be the greatest common factor. And the y squared minus the z becomes the other factor. So this is the factorization of the original problem. So this is your factored form. Now to check yourself before you wreck yourself, you can always take your two factors, the ones that you think are going to work and then use the handshake method, 2y squared, negative 2z, negative ay squared, positive az. And then it might be in a different order, but all of these should be the terms from the original problem. We have 2y here, 2y there, negative z here, Negative, uh, negative 2z there. Negative ay squared, negative ay squared, positive az, positive az. So, so this checks out. This factorization does work. OK, let's take a break. And we'll come back at uh, 157. Yeah, basically we'll start up at two, okay? Let's take a break, get some water, stretch, get some sunlight. And I'll see you guys back around two. Method three is gonna be factoring trinomials using the AC method. And I'll explain what I mean here by AC method. Okay. So here's the dilemma. We want to be able to factor polynomials into simpler factors. Because to solve all sorts of complicated equations that we're going to run into later, 
including quadratic equations, we want to be able to take a complicated polynomial and break it down into its linear factors. That's going to make more sense later on, the specific terminology. But the dilemma is, what happens when I can't factor out the GCF and I can't factor by grouping because I've been given something like this? Um, 4y squared minus 11y plus 6. <clears throat> okay, so this is like you're, you're going to investigate this polynomial, right? Because you're going to come across these polynomials in your homework sets. Um, this polynomial, the features of the polynomial, are one. This only has three terms. We call that a trinomial. Two. Uh, if I look at all three terms, 4y squared, 11y, 6. Well, the 4 and the 6 have a 2 in common. These first two terms have a y in common. But they don't all have a GCF. So not all terms have a common factor. OK. Well, the other issue is that I only have three terms. I don't have four terms. So I can't break this into two smaller polynomials, each with two terms, and factor by grouping like I did on the last problem. So somehow, it would be nice if I could turn this into a four-term polynomial. Because then I could factor by grouping, like we saw in our last examples. Well, remember I said that this is sort of like um, our variable terms. These are not like terms, right? We have y squares, we have y's, and then we have a constant. So we can think of them like apples, oranges, bananas. OK, well, for factoring by grouping, it was really nice to have two terms in the middle. So we could think about this as being like 4y squared. Um, and then this middle term, it would be nice if I had two terms here. And then I had the plus 6 at the end. But I don't really know what needs to go here. And uh, we're sort of playing a dangerous game here, just guessing um, what I could potentially put here that would be equal to negative 11y. Because there's a lot of choices for what could be equal to negative 11, negative 11y. So I could say that negative 11y is equal to uh, negative 10y minus 1y. But if I put these terms here, then the negative 10y and the negative, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the 4y squared and the negative 10y wouldn't have, would have a y in common and a 2 in common. Um, and a negative 1y here and the six don't seem like they have anything in common, right? And I'm looking for like that special scenario where these two things have something in common and these two things have something in common so that I can just factor by grouping. 
Uh, okay, so maybe you make another guess. Um, maybe we could call this negative 11y is equal to, we could say negative 4y and minus, um, what would I need to get to 11? I would need to subtract 7. But that doesn't seem to work either because now these have something in common, but this 6 and the 7 wouldn't. And honestly, I could keep playing this game and guessing forever and get some really weird things like negative 11y is equal to, um, I mean, I could say positive 10y and minus 21y. But like, again, I'm just guessing here. The condition I'm trying to meet is that whatever these two terms are, they need to add to make negative 11y. And there's an infinite number of guesses that I could make. So how, you know, is there a system for making the correct guess where I don't have to like write down every possibility and waste my time? And it turns out that there is a process for doing that. Okay. So let's look at the original problem. What was it? It was, um, 4y squared minus 11y plus 6. Okay. This is the AC method. And the reason why it's called the AC method is because what we want to do is label our coefficients a, b, and c. So this numbers in front of the variables we're going to call this a, b, and C. Now the AC method is going to uh, give us a way to split the middle term into the correct pair of terms so that we can factor by grouping. And the reason why it's called the AC method is because we need to multiply A times C as our first step. So what is A times C here? Well, it's just four times six, right? So A times C is equal to four times six which is 24. Okay. It might seem like we're doing this for no reason, but trust me, we're doing it because it works. Okay. We don't have to understand why it works. I'm just, you know, you're going to have to trust me that it does work and it'll get us to where we want to go. The next step is that we want to factor, uh, basically make a T chart of all the factors of A times C, whatever that number turned out to be. In this case, it's 24. So I'll make a factor table and just list all of the factors, all the numbers that multiply to make 24. So one times 24, two times 12, three times eight, four times six. And that's it, that's all the factors. Because five times something doesn't give you 24. And then you're back at six, six times four. So you don't have to repeat yourself. Okay. So we're looking for the factor pair that meets these conditions. So three, choose the factor pair meeting these conditions. The first condition is that the first factor plus the second factor needs to add to make B, which is um, negative 11. Okay, this is B. The second um, 
condition is that those factors need to multiply to make 24, which is A times C. So the easiest thing to do, uh, to do first here, is to look at these pairs and see what adds or subtracts to give us something close to 11. And I'm sort of ignoring the sign a little bit here. So I'll let you write this down and catch up. But of this set of factor pairs, which one gives us 11 if we add them? Three and eight. Three and eight. Good. But if I add them, I'll get positive 11. So what I can do is say that, okay, what if I chose negative three and negative eight? That will add to give me the negative 11. So that works. And then if I made these negative three and negative eight, do they multiply to give me positive 24? Well, yeah, that works. Does anybody have questions about that? Okay, now some people get confused on the signs here. Um, these are not all of the factors of 24, right? Because one positive one times positive 24 gives you 24, positive times positive gives you the positive, positive times positive, positive times positive, blah, right? But because this is positive, I could also make this a negative one and a negative 24, or a negative two and a negative 12, or a negative three and a negative eight. Because this is positive, both of the factors need to be either positive or they both need to be negative so that the product is positive, okay? But these are the two conditions that we need to make, that we need to meet uh, in order to proceed with the problem. So we found that our factors are negative three and negative eight. All of this is scratch work because we just needed these factors. What we're gonna do with those factors or go back to the original polynomial. And we're gonna take this middle term, the negative 11, and break it up into two terms. And we're gonna break it up into, uh, it doesn't matter what order you put this in. I'm gonna put the eight first, because what we're trying to do is make a four term problem here. So the two middle terms, I'm going to put minus 8y and minus 3y here. The numbers come from the factors that we found over here. And if you add these two terms together, if you combine these like terms, you get the original negative 11y. So this polynomial is equal to this polynomial. Does anybody have any questions about that? This scratch work is really the AC method. Okay. The rest of it is now factoring by grouping because now we have a four term polynomial. So let's just proceed with the, the factoring by grouping and we'll talk more about the AC method and we'll have more examples of that, okay? So just like we did before, if we're factoring by grouping, we'll take a look at these two terms and ask ourselves, what do they have in common? What's their greatest common factor? It turns out that that is four y and that we have y here minus two there. 
Is everybody okay with this factorization? I know some of you guys might be still hanging on with this AC method part, but you know, just hold that in your head for a second. We'll come back to it. We're just gonna go ahead and proceed with factoring by grouping. So these two terms, the negative sign is important. I'm gonna bring a negative down. They have a three in common, so I'll factor out that three. And then I need a Y here and I need a minus two here. Now, the reason why this is Y minus two is because one, these need to match and negative three times Y gives you negative three Y and negative three times negative two gives you the positive six. But like I said, since these guys match, this is now the common factor. And we can pull that out to the front, y minus two, and then what's left over becomes your other factor. And that's it. That's the factored form of the original trinomial. Okay, so let's, let's do another example that's similar. Um, I sort of want you guys to take the reins on it. So uh, this will be example two. I'm gonna write it over here. Five Z squared plus four Z minus 12. So we're gonna factor the trinomial. Okay, so flipping back to your notes and what we just did, what's the first step here? Multiply A and C. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's perfectly uh, acceptable. What I would do for, for those of you who, you know, might need the, the little assistance, go ahead and label the numbers A, B, and C. And then the first step is for sure, A times C is equal to five times negative 12. And what should I get? Sixty. Yeah, negative 60. Okay. Then my second step is going to be to make a t-chart of all the factors of 60. So one times 60. And I always start with one and count up. Two times 30. Three times 20. I don't know if four works, but here you might have to have your calculator on hand. Um, just to make this process a little bit faster. So I might have 60 divided by four, so four and 15. 60 divided by five, five and 12. Some of them you might know off the top of your head, like six and 10. And then others you might say, okay, 60 divided by seven, I don't know if that'll work. It doesn't because I have a decimal here. 60 divided by eight doesn't work. Again, decimal, we need, we need those factors to go in evenly. Uh, I don't think nine works. And then we're back at 10, so we can stop. The third step is that we need to meet those two conditions. Which are that the two factors need to add to make the middle term, which is four, positive four, and they need to multiply to make negative 60.
So of these factors, what pair will add to make four or multiply to make negative 60? And when I say add, I'm using that word very loosely. I mean, add or subtract. So if I look at these pairs, can I add or subtract some of these numbers to give me four? Well, six and 10, but you said they both, they, if they both have to either be negative or both have to be positive, correct? Uh, that was correct on the last one. But it turns out that here, six and 10 are the only thing that are gonna give me something close to four, right? When I add or subtract those. So if I subtracted them uh, and I wanted to get a positive four, which one of these would I be subtracting from the other? Would it be 10 minus six or would it be six minus 10? Minus 10 plus six. Well, if I had a minus 10 plus six, that would be a negative four and I need a positive four. Yeah, sorry. So it needs to be the opposite way. Okay, so I need positive 10 and negative six. Positive 10 times negative six gives me the negative 60. So I get to place the negative sign here in order to make sure that both of these conditions are checked off. Okay, does anybody have any questions about that? The, the, the numbers here will change, right? In this last problem, the product that I got when I multiplied A times C was a positive. And you can get positive products when you have two positive factors or two negative factors, right? So these two negative factors multiplied to give me this positive. But when you have a negative product, only one of those, those factors can be negative. So that's the difference here that you have to watch out for. But once you get this selection correct and make sure that both of these conditions are met and that you're not trying to force them because when you force the two numbers to work and you throw an extra sign in there because you think, okay, that, that should work. That's a lot of times when, when students will make mistakes. So be very careful about not adding something or multiplying something in that doesn't make any sense. But once we have these numbers, the 10 and the negative six, well, that's what I'm gonna take, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna use that to break up the middle term. So what I should have here is 10z minus six z and Sure enough, if I were to combine these like terms, I get my positive 4z. I'll just bring my negative 12 down and I'll bring my 5z squared down. And this is a positive 10. So I'll make that very explicit here by putting a positive 10. But now I have my four term problem and I can factor by grouping. Okay, so these two terms have something in common. We're just factoring by grouping. So factoring out the, common, the greatest common factor, they have a five Z in common. And that will leave me with, I need a Z here so that I get my Z squared back. And I need a plus two here so that I can get that 10 Z. Both of these are negative. I'm gonna factor out a negative because the first term is negative and they seem to have a six in common. That's their greatest common factor. You could say three, but we want the greatest common factor. So six there, they don't have a Z in common so I can open up my parentheses. And then in the parentheses, I need a Z here to get my negative six Z back. And I need a positive two because a negative times a positive will give me that negative 12. The factor, the polynomial factor in the parentheses 
is common between the two terms now. So I'm going to factor out z plus 2. And my remaining terms get compacted into my other factor. And that, my good friends, is factored. Okay, so what I want to do for the next 10 minutes is give you guys two problems to work in breakout rooms. Um, so let me write those down. And maybe, you know, maybe I'll just do the one. Um, because we don't have a whole lot of time. But I do want you guys to be able to, you know, get in there, ask questions, make mistakes, talk it out. Okay, factor the trinomial using the AC method. Okay, I've created the breakout rooms. So let's just work on this, work on it as a group, talk it out. And uh, we'll just give it about eight minutes and then I'll just be checking in on you. <laughs> 